Um, well, so I'm Eugene Goltz. Uh, uh, I'm a professor at the LBJ School and a senior fellow in the Strauss Center for International Security and Law, which sponsors this series of talks or co-sponsors with the LBJ Presidential Library. And we always thank Betty Sue Flowers, the director of the library, for offering us this wonderful space and helping us uh, with actually many aspects, not just the space. So, uh, thank you to the library. Um, uh, uh, usually, before I introduce the speaker, I have a, a shtick and. This is no, no exception. Uh, you have to advertise the next talk. And um, so to let all of you know, the next talk uh, is actually the last one of the semester. It's next Tuesday evening at 5 o'clock here, uh, uh, same time, same place, uh, one week later. Uh, we're going to have Joan Dempsey, um, who uh, has uh, tremendous experience in the intelligence community, um, uh, both in DOD and in um, uh, later uh, CIA, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And uh, she's now uh, at Booz Allen Hamilton um, uh, as a vice president, but she'll be here next week to, to talk uh, on the provocative subject of back to black. Uh, her pitch <laughs> is that um, uh, public scrutiny of uh, a lot of, kind of national security secrets in the intelligence community has not helped improve the accuracy or oversight of intelligence, and in fact tends to make things worse because it's just voyeuristic. And uh, uh, so she's going to make a provocative argument that we should have more secrecy in our intelligence community. And I suspect many of you will be uh, uh, interested in uh, um, uh, hearing if she has an argument that you find at all persuasive. So um, that will be next Tuesday uh, here. You know, should be Tuesday. Tonight. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to have Karen Minks here. Um, uh, Karen uh, and I uh, became good friends and uh, knew each other while we were both teaching at the University of Kentucky, and she is still uh, the Lockwood Chair Professor. Um, and I'm going to get it wrong, but it's International Commerce and Entrepreneurship, something like that is the no formal idea. title of this. <laughs> right. Um, so it, it's right. That part doesn't come up as often. It's, it's a, a title at, at the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce, which is uh, 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 a great master's program in international affairs, professional master's program. But Karen really is one of the leading uh, experts on um, international organization. In fact, uh, um, I think if uh, this is being broadcast, and I'm hoping no one from the um, uh, FTC or the Antitrust Division at the Department of Justice is listening, um, but she close to has the monopoly on textbooks <laughs> about uh, international relations, particularly international, well, international relations in general, she does that, but then also specifically the international organization component of international relations. She, she knows a lot, she knows how to explain it very clearly, and, um, uh, and people love her. Um, and so it's is a, a, a fairly one monopoly. There's nothing nefarious going on. And so the FTC people <laughs> don't need to harass Karen. But, um, but she knows a lot and, and in this, in this uh, framework. And then the other aspect of her research over the years um, is uh, on Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. Although she says this and she knows a lot about Sub-Saharan Africa, but if you look at her CV, the list of places she's been to study and do research all around the world and kind of understand uh, international law, international organizations, and, and um, more and more uh, NGOs uh, and other, other actors in international She's been in Yugoslavia, she's been in Vietnam, she's not in Africa, I think. It's something I've noticed. But, but, but she really is an expert uh, on, on Africa as well, and I suspect these issues are going to come together in the talk today. Um, on uh, humanitarian NGOs in uh, uh, armed conflict, I was going to say in conflict-ridden situations, but that's a better title. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, so without further ado, let's have Karen's talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here um, and in your midst. Um, and thanks, Jean, for that um, a nice introduction. Um, this, this talk um, is a policy-oriented talk, and um, it evolved from some of my interest, really, in um, NGOs. Uh, and I have been working um, in revising a book of 
about um, really global governance in which uh, the NGO component is uh, becoming an increasingly stronger uh, portion. Um, and so uh, the title of my talk is Humanitarian NGOs. Uh, my more theoretical issues that I probably will not be addressing today are really on agency and autonomy, um, but that is um, the talk that we're doing today. Um, the two quotes that I, I have up here um, are, I think, represent in part some of the fundamental dilemmas about humanitarian NGOs in conflict. Uh, the battle between the bloody hand and the bleeding heart. Um, the other, the, the notion of the balancing act between the operational impartiality of the political eunuch, we are here to save lives, um, politics is not our business, and the shrewd maneuvering of the humanitarian prostitute. We are ready to compromise so we can get through. And these quotes, as I said, set up the fundamental uh, dilemma that we're going to talk about. So what I would like to do f is present to you with sort of five major, what I see as dilemmas for humanitarian NGOs in conflict. And um, as a way to get into that, first go through some major shifts in the international system, of which I know you are all familiar, um, but shifts that are particularly appropriate to this topic. And then there's some changing norms in international relations, which again, um, have made this topic of, of perhaps greater interest. So in terms of, very briefly, some, some major shifts um, in the international security environment, three are, are particularly important here. Um, the change in the nature uh, of warfare, um, increasing number and presence of NGOs, um, and the media uh, presence um, in, in conflict. The trend that you are, of course, well aware of is that um, both interstate and um, intrastate wars have declined in the number. Um, and the nature of that, uh, after peaking certainly in the, the beginning of the 90s, as this graph shows. Um, and part of that changing nature of, of warfare has been the increasing use of precision instruments, um, precision weaponry. Um, as well as the fact that a lot of the wars, particularly in some of the developing parts of the world, are lasting decades that much more directly affect um, domestic populations. Part of the change in the increasing number and presence of humanitarian actors on this battlefield, particularly in the Civil War situations, um, and there's some explanations for why we see their increasing presence. Um, the increasing number of refugees, so even though the numbers of interstate wars have declined, the increasing number of refugees have actually uh, increased. Uh, the protracted um, conflicts lasting a long time, the increasing capacity of NGOs themselves, and the tendency of states to subcontract um, and the international governmental organizations uh, like the UN to subcontract responsibilities um, to um, NGOs. Um, this gives you one part of the explanation for why you have more NGOs um, involved in the conflict areas, um, just the, incre the numbers of refugees um, that you can see um, in that. So while even the wars have decreased, the numbers of refugees and, and perhaps more importantly displaced persons um, that need aid um, has increased even while war has um, decreased. The third change that you see that is important in terms of a general international shift um, is the media presence uh, in these conflict situations. Um, as we are all aware, the handheld camera, the CNN, the 24 news cycle means that even the smallest wars in the most obscure places um, come up in, in the media. Um, and there's certainly been a lot of very interesting research on the effects that this has had um, on that conduct of the war, in particular the public relations part of, of that war. Um, and this is particularly important for NGOs because if one of the, uh, the needs of NGOs is to raise money uh, and to get legitimacy, um, they need to be involved in wars, particularly wars that that capture the public's imagination. Um, and 
uh, very often um, this fundraising really drives um, and is a response to the media presence. And of course this media is in part um, biased. Uh, one of my PhD students did a, a dissertation in which they compared media coverage of the war in, um, in Kosovo with the wars in Africa and it, uh, looking at nightly newscasts of these and the media images of this. And um, the, the one on your, your right is the media from Kosovo or the portrayal, um, white women carrying babies. And on the left is the media from uh, the Rwandan conflict, um, uh, black Africans with machetes um, killing babies. Uh, very different images and the numbers are very clear of how the media projects these kinds of images. Now it's not only been these changes in the international system that have made this topic perhaps more important, but it's also been some shift in international norms. Um, and two of them are here, the expanding view of who is human um, over time and therefore merits protection um, and the notion of an ethical responsibility of the international community to do something. For centuries, um, only those people who were, quote, worthy of protection uh, were Christians. Um, that were being mistreated, if you look at uh, European history, mistreated by the Ottoman Turks. Um, that gradually expanded in the 19th century, and obviously we started expanding it to those uh, enslaved. Thus, the abolition of slavery and the slave trade in the 19th century was another step toward this notion of a universalization of, of humanity. And so you come to a point where human beings who were previously viewed as beyond the edge of humanity, um, as in fact property, came to be viewed uh, as human. Um, and by the 20th century, uh, that normative belief or those normative understandings about who, who was human um, uh, meant that it was not only that you would bring the, those individuals out of slavery, bring those savages out of slavery, as it were, um, but they also merit protection as inherently being human. And this has become increasingly universalized um, and not being um, culturally um, dependent. But then there is also this notion um, that an ethical responsibility to do something, to respond, to intervene on the behalf of those humans. Um, if, we, if we look back, uh, the US military references to the intervention in Somalia um, uh, was to feed the people. I mean, originally that was the original mandate under which the United States um, entered into that conflict. Um, in Afghanistan, this notion of rescuing people from tyranny and oppression and improving women's access to education, health care, the return of refugees, uh, et cetera. Now, we all know that's not the only reason for intervention, um, but certainly that notion that, and an increasingly view that, that there was a need to do something, even if that this is uh, mimicked, um, obviously, in this cartoon, um, has become an emerging norm. Uh, in international relations, that view has been termed the responsibility uh, to protect, a new discourse about this emerging norm. Um, and that's a view that it really is the state's responsibility to protect those individuals under their tutelage. But if the state fails to do that, um, if the state fails to carry out its obligations, then it is the international community that is obligated to act. So with responsibility to protect, it's not the, we're not abrogating state sovereignty, but what is happening is they're affirming the state's um, responsibility um, to protect. There is a uh, Garth Evans, uh, the former prime minister of, um, of Australia, has a new book just was published in paperback, The Responsibility to Protect. It actually is 
uh, part of a discourse about how this developed, um, but it's also very policy relevant in, in looking at specific conditions under which the international community might choose to, um, to act. Now there's some also some other changing norms, um, and one is another one is that increasing discussion um, of the laws of war. Uh, obviously, these laws of war, both conduct when to go to war, the just war theory, as well as conduct within war, um, have been around a long time. Um, I know when I first started teaching, we were teaching to students who had probably never heard of those. Um, that obviously has changed. Um, the Geneva Convention became very, very well known. Um, and, and so there's a discourse about combatants and non-combatants, about collateral damage, um, discussion made possible by this advanced um, precision uh, weaponry. Um, one of my former PhD students um, talks about during the first Gulf War when he was a, a targeter in, in the Air Force and, and they would sit down to target the uh, points in, in Iraq and they would do an assessment of the collateral damage. And um, if, if it extended beyond and there were hospitals or other uh, institutions hit, um, they would get demerits in, their, in, in the military. Um, some of you may have seen the recent um, movie, uh, Waltz with Brashear, um, obviously um, coming out at a very, uh, very auspicious time um, following the Israeli um, invasion of Gaza. Um, and again, calling attention to the whole question of war crimes. Um, so this change of norm and this changing relevance is part of this changing um, norms itself. And finally, there's some changes of norms about humanitarian actors themselves. Um, sort of a moving away from the view that humanitarian actors are always unselfish, altruistic uh, individual, volunteers, to a view that um, humanitarians are professionals. Um, they have specialized skills. Some of you may want to be a professional humanitarian. Um, they must be held accountable. They must be held effective. Um, so it's a very different notion of who are the humanitarians and um, their place within um, both the changes in the international system, but also the changes of, that have taken place because of these changing normative conditions. So we have already, among the most well-known humanitarian NGOs, obviously the International Red Cross, Red Crescent uh, Movement, um, which has always had a very special place in humanitarianism uh, in war. In 1994, um, they um, organized a, a code of conduct of which a number of the other humanitarian NGOs, some of whom are, are visualized here, um, came together uh, and developed um, and then signed. And a couple of, of the provisions here um, are very critical because that's what raises our whole problem of, of dilemmas. Um, the notion that aid should be re given regardless of race, creed, nationality. Um, that it should not further political standpoint. Um, that it should not act um, as, or NGOs should not act as instruments of government. Um, that they need to build upon local um, capacities um, and involve program beneficiaries in the humanitarian uh, work um, that is done. Um, that the aid should reduce future vulnerabilities. In other words, it should be future oriented. Um, that they should hold themselves accountable, uh, recognize disaster victims as dignified humans. Um, and these, the, the part of this code of conduct, uh, which is obviously a uh, voluntary kind of code of ethics, really, about the humanitarian uh, enterprise, um, is sort of summed up in the traditional norms that we associate with humanitarian NGOs which are the norms of impartiality, neutra neutrality, um, and independence. 
And it is those three traditional norms of impartiality, uh, neutrality, and independence um, which brings us uh, very clearly to um, the sets of, of dilemmas um, that I have laid out, or I'm going to lay out. The first dilemma. The code says that um, aid is given on the basis of need alone, um, and that's impartiality, and that's regardless of race, creed, or nationality. But the code also stipulates that aid is not to be used to uh, further a pr particular political standpoint. So our dilemma is what if acting impartially actually furthers the objectives of another? What if by acting impartially one is inadvertently helping um, others? Kind of a classic <laughs> dilemma that we're faced here. Um, the case of Rwanda, there has been a lot of research on in which that exact dilemma um, was confronted. Uh, the situations that the NGOs um, under uh, the UN uh, uh, Commission on Refugees um, set up these refugee camps, giving refuge to Tutsis who were fleeing the genocide in the neighboring countries. Um, among those refugees were Hutus, um, and the, uh, over time what happened was the Hutus um, a number of those groups um, did seize control uh, of the camps, um, and that included sort of former army personnel, uh, former government personnel. And when I say seize control of the camps, um, what I'm really talking about is they were able to control the supplies because they used individuals in the camps to distribute the resources. Um, they, the, they developed their own taxing system on their people. Um, they were generating their own income and filtering out that income to support uh, further, um, further violence. Um, that became very clear, and the humanitarian NGOs then were confronted with the issue. What do we do? I mean, these people, some people in those camps certainly needed the aid. Um, and yet by providing that aid, because of the dynamics that had happened, um, they were in fact um, not supporting a particular political um, position. Um, and Fiona Terry in the book, Doctor, in, in, who uh, wrote a, a very excellent book um, on this, the Condemned to Repeat, uh, who herself was uh, from Doctors Without Borders, one of the groups that was involved um, in the refugee camps and had a very vigorous discussion um, among certain of the groups about what they should do. And there, the NGO community, um, very, very vehement discussions. And she put it this way, should a humanitarian aid organization professing to alleviate suffering be an accomplice of a system which so obviously violates um, this fundamental principle? So, some NGOs chose to stay um, because of the need to help others. Others, like Doctors Without Borders, um, who does not abide by the, the code, they do not proclaim to be neutral in these kinds of situations. Um, some of the groups within Doctors Without Borders uh, pulled out, um, as did some other. Uh, International Rescue Committee um, also uh, left that particular uh, situation. Dilemma number two. Um, the code states that humanitarian NGOs are independent actors, apolitical organizations who formulate their own policies and implementation strategies. They're not instruments of foreign governments. Um, and that is explicitly in the code. And yet our dilemma um, that we're confronted with is that can NGOs be independent when they are increasingly reliant on governments for funding and they actually work with governments um, in the field. Now there is a long history of um, NGOs um, working with governments in the field. Um, Catholic Relief Services, for example, worked very closely with the U.S. government in uh, the war in Vietnam, in South Vietnam. Um, International Rescue Committee uh, worked uh, very closely to aid the Afghan refugees flee in Afghanistan under, when it was under control of um, the Soviet Union um, in support of the U.S. Um, position. 
um, European NGOs uh, worked um, in El Salvador in support of the FMLN. Um, the US NGOs chose to work on the other side in support of the US um, government. So there is a history of this. The question becomes is when we have this um, NGO dependence on governments for funding. Um, and one of the trends that we see in NGOs and in states is that states give an increasing percentage of their um, humanitarian aid budget to NGOs to administer, uh, subcontract that work to, end, to the um, humanitarian NGOs. Um, at the same time, the international organizations increasingly give more of their budget to NGOs uh, to, uh, to administer. So in the European Union, for example, 51% of its humanitarian aid budget is distributed through um, NGOs. Most telling, however, is, are the data that you have here in that some NGOs depend um, on donor government aid. Um, Care USA, 40, and these figures are extremely wishy. <laughs> it's very difficult to get, and it, in fact, it varies quite considerably year by year. Um, but CARE, for example, gets about 70% from the U.S. government of their budget. Save the Children, about 40%. International Rescue Committee, 80%. Um, World Vision, um, about 20 to 35%, um, just to give you some representative uh, figures. So the real question is, can you be independent when you are getting such a high percentage of your um, budget from um, the government? Um, the other issue is working with, can you be independent when you, in fact, are working with uh, the governments in the field, um, particularly in conflict situations? Um, and Colin Powell <laughs> uh, sort of inadvertently um, stated kind of the dilemma because he said, you know, we see NGOs as a, quote, force multiplier, uh, such an important part of our combat team. Um, in, in the war on terror. Um, in many in the humanitarian community, this sort of sends shivers up your spine, <laughs> um, not necessarily seeing yourself as a force multiplier um, and not necessarily wanting to be part of the combat uh, team. And yet in Kosovo, um, in, in that particular conflict, um, the NGOs worked very clearly in the field with NATO. Um, it was only Doctors Without Borders that refused um, to do so. Um, and the result is that the NGOs, in general, did not criticize NATO actions, um, even though there was plenty of reason um, to do so. Um, and that relationship um, has continued, of course, in, in most notably in Afghanistan, um, and there has been certainly a lot of of, uh, of comments about the NGOs and that working with in the PRTs and reconstruction teams um, in Afghanistan. In, there was an interesting focus groups conducted in Afghanistan, um, focus groups of surveys uh, of Afghanis about their perceptions of NGOs. Um, these were conducted in Actually, the, the, public, the study was published in 2007. Uh, this represents work done in 2006. And these were some of the perceptions of, you know, in, um, that were held, that the NGOs collect intelligence for governments. Um, very close relationship with the intelligence community. And of course, we know in some cases that's true, um, and in some cases it is not. Uh, the notion that the NGOs are spreading alien values and meaning generally values of the um, occupying country. Um, that the NGOs participate in corruption. Um, and in fact, some studies by Transparency International um, suggest that in the Afghan case, some NGOs are um, involved in corrupt uh, activities. Um, and on the part of, these are local level people in Afghanistan, and there's also this questioning of the motives, um, that they're really there um, to make money. Um, in other words, really questioning of the humanitarian um, 
Now that's not surprising considering we have increasing professionalization of humanitarian uh, NGOs. Um, but certainly the last quote that came out of those interviews, NGOs are nearly as bad as warlords, um, a, a notion that came out of it um, suggests that clearly the images and the perceptions held by people on the ground um, creates um, certainly a, a dilemma that whether the NGOs are acting in, as in their independent capacity. The third dilemma um, de suggests that humanitarian action um, depends on neutrality. Um, the need to have protected humanitarian space um, to operate. Yet, as we all know, humanitarians in the field are um, increasingly under, um, under continuous threats. So the dilemma is, can humanitarians preserve their neutrality when they cannot easily be distinguished and when they rely on armed protection? And in sometimes that armed protection includes private security forces uh, who are also protecting you know, US government personnel and others in the field. In Iraq, for example, um, the Red Cross you know, traditionally uses the Red Cross symbol as the, their a symbol of being an independent, um, neutral humanitarian organization. Um, but the coalition forces also use the emblem on military equipment. Um, U.S. soldiers, when they start distributing um, aid, um, at times take off their uniforms when distributing aid. And again, the studies of how people react to this on the ground, people are unable sometimes to distinguish between you know, U.S. military personnel um, versus uh, humanitarian um, workers. So it's very confusing. So not surprising this confusion in the field, um, it's clear why humanitarian NGOs are under attack um, and suffer the violence themselves. The, between 19... 97 and 2006, there were around 500 incidents of major violence um, involving uh, about 1,000 victims um, of humanitarian NGOs. Um, some of those involved fatalities, kidnappings, um, and some of them were, um, were personal violence, uh, cases of personal violence. Now, in itself, that may not be high compared to now the numbers of humanitarians that are in the field, um, because those numbers have increased dramatically. Who seems to be the victim are the nationals who are working for the humanitarian NGOs. Um, they seem to be, be the, have the brunt of the attacks are on those um, individuals. Um, about 80% of the victims are national staff. Um, but clearly, the NGO community is concerned. Um, and in Afghanistan, in fact, they set up an NGO safety office, um, an, an attempt partly so that the NGOs wouldn't leave. Um, and in 2008, you know, we still have the killings and the attacks and the abductions um, in, in Afghanistan. The statute of the International Criminal Court um, actually identifies attacks on aid workers in conflict zones as war crimes, um, which is kind of a, a sideline development. But of course, the International Criminal Court has just begun proceedings, um, and they're dealing with much more bigger fish, in a sense. Um, and have, those cases are, are not being brought up. But it is interesting, just as a war crime, attacks against humanitarian workers are considered a uh, war crime. But we can explain why we see this is these attacks is because they really are not as differentiated from those who are conducting uh, the warfare. And so that's why we have the humanitarian community um, hiring private security guards um, to uh, provide um, to provide security. Uh, Again, and some NGOs have refused this because of the signal that it sends um, to the domestic populations, um, and others have been forced to accept them um, because of uh, the security threats. 
The fourth um, dilemma is that humanitarian NGOs have become much more professionalized and institutionalized, as I suggested before. Um, and in, in part, um, there has been a, a greater demand for accountability and evidence of their effectiveness. Um, again, governments give money to NGOs. We want them to be effective. We want them to be accountable. International organizations give money. We think that they ought to be accountable and, and effective. But the dilemma um, that a number of, of writers have brought up is can humanitarian NGOs become more institutionalized, more bureaucratized, more professionalized, while still maintaining <coughs> their flexibility and their ability to quickly adjust to um, local um, situations? And there are two sort of points about this. One is the accountability uh, issue. Um, and when we talk about accountability, we know part of this is a budgetary accountability. Um, and part of the, you know, the NGO community has increasingly complained. The numbers of forms you have to fill out to get these, use and utilize the, uh, the monies that you have. Um, the demand to do this in the field that takes up resources, it takes up time. Um, the, the need to only use money for exactly a specified source when in fact the situation may change on the ground and you may need to use it in a slightly different way. And the argument has been made that this need for accountability in a sense might promote sort of risk adverse behavior. Um, that you're, not, you're unwilling to try new things, you're unwilling to respond to the moment because of this overarching need to provide um, accountability. Um, uh, taken too far, uh, or taken too literally, um, as one writer says, they see it as a strategy for humanitarian containment, not for humanitarian uh, action. Now, clearly there's a balance act here. Accountability is important, but the question is whether accountability is, is really the panacea. It's expensive, it takes time, um, and it may lead to unintended uh, consequences. The other part of this dilemma um, is that what we have seen is increasing competition among NGOs for scarce resources. Um, this graph, and you may not um, be able to see it very well, but the, 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 the straight line um, is the number of NGOs that receive money from the U.S. government. Obviously a very, very increasing line. On the other hand, is the, the dotted line is the percentage of total revenues received by the top 10 NGOs. In other words, the top 10 have a declining share because of the increasing number. And there has been some, some very excellent now case studies of this NGO competition for scarce resources, where there's a real bureaucratic fight for these scarce um, resources. And that, in a sense, means that you have to um, operate on a year-to-year -year basis in order to get funding. Um, it means you have to justify your program needs in terms of very specific priorities, um, when in fact they not be your, your strength, and there's very short time frames. The other thing that this kind of competition does um, is that it may lead I say may, um, to sort of declining legitimacy of the NGOs in general. If NGOs are just like any other interest group, scrambling to get, scrambling to get resources, um, that their legitimacy as, as being um, neutral and humanitarian and serving these higher objectives uh, may be jeopardized. And finally, uh, the fifth dilemma. Uh, stems from this humanitarian imperative to relieve human suffering, and that should be the first priority. Um, but the dilemma, I think, is clear. What if this imperative to relieve immediate suffering comes at the expense of other objectives, like building the capacity of states so that states can do what they should be doing, um, the states to respond, or the possibility that caring for these, this immediate needs might actually prolong the conflict um, itself. And this has been, um, uh, has a lot of interest in this. 
um, uh, this possibility. Um, in Liberia in 1996, for example, um, humanitarians realized that what they were doing was prolonging the war. And a number, about 13 NGOs um, came together and what they agreed to some certain policies in order to try to um, mitigate those effects. Um, they did not bring in new equipment because new equipment was being um, uh, exploited and was being used then to continue the war. Um, they only used locally available equipment. Um, they didn't bring in new resources. They just tried to make do what they had because of the very chaotic situation um, that they had. And of course, with the Rwandan genocide, that possibility um, also uh, was raised, that um, preventing the, the absolute defeat of the regime may have prolonged um, the, the, the suffering in the long term. Um, and certainly that is part of the argument about Darfur um, at, the at the current time. Um, that the humanitarian uh, actions in Darfur, uh, from the viewpoint of the donor states, it's serving the purpose of alleviating, uh, 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 is helping our conscience, um, since the decision is clearly not made to uh, may take strong military action. So we send the NGOs in, um, let them try to relieve immediate suffering, uh, but not give them enough authority to actually um, stop the genocide. And of course, NGOs couldn't themselves do that. With the recipient state, um, then it relieves them of responsibility uh, to have to try to address the massive displacements of people, uh, the refugees um, situation. Um, and, and therefore, then blame gets put on the NGOs because they're not um, providing the necessary um, services. So there has been this argument um, that, in a sense, if you let the war continue, play out, get winners and losers, um, that it, the war might end sooner should you not have um, the level of uh, international or of humanitarian intervention um, that seems to be sort of staving off complete chaos um, in that part of, uh, of the world. Sadako Ogata, the UN High Commissioner on Refugees, I think, said it fairly well. She says um, in the conclusion to her book, or maybe at the beginning, she says there are no humanitarian solutions uh, to humanitarian uh, problems. Um, some of the research that I have been and conducting is trying to look inside these NGOs and look inside and look at the debates that have gone on within the International Rescue Committee or the Doctors Without Borders, some of the groups where it's possible to get this kind of information um, and see the kinds of debates that they have had and also then the actions that they have taken, um, not only in your high profile cases, um, but also in your much less, um, uh, your other cases that are a little bit further into the public consciousness. But what we might have here in terms of, uh, of these dilemmas, in a sense, is we might have, in the sense, um, an intractable dilemma ourselves in that there's, there's no solution <laughs> um, out of the five dilemmas that I think um, the humanitarian NGOs, particularly in armed conflict, uh, present to themselves. <laughs> Um, I put up just a couple of books that I, if any of you are interested in this topic, um, the, the first one is uh, Fiona Terry's book um, on your far left, um, which is the, uh, I think, an excellent book, Condemned to Repeat, um, The Paradox of Humanitarian Action, a really uh, very good first-hand account. Um, well, she goes through a number of different crises and first-hand in the sense of she was a participant through Doctors Without Borders. Um, um, Sarah Lesher's book called Dangerous Sanctuaries, um, which looks at very much the same issue, and um, Garth Evans' very new book, The Responsibility to Protect, um, which I think gives policymakers um, a sort of a toolbox, and he calls them toolboxes for the, what the international community can do to protect both pre-crisis, crisis, and post-crisis situations. And it's part of fulfilling that norm that I suggested is that um, there is an increasing reaction that we, the international community, should be doing something. Um, and that change in belief structure um, is, is 
pose, poses some of the problems that I've alluded to today. So thank you very much. And well, th thank you, Karen. That, that was uh, a terrific presentation. I, I, uh, I love dilemmas. It's the important message that there are no easy answers in the world. So um, uh, my guess is you stirred up some questions. Maybe not at 5 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I was particularly provoked by um, dilemma number four. By the way, I think you were spot on with, with all these dilemmas. But dilemma number four struck me as particularly interesting because there seems to be in the literature a sort of growing cynicism about NGOs, and not about their effectiveness, but about their motives. Mm -hmm. And I immediately started thinking about Clifford Bob's book about marketing and rebellion, right, right. where he talks about really how NGOs can be very strategic and self-interested in choosing the causes that they're going to champion uh, based upon where they can get money and where they can yeah. get media attention. That was about human rights NGOs. Do yeah. you think the same sort of dilemma applies to humanitarian NGOs? Well, he was looking, I mean, in Clifford Bob's book, is what I understand is that he was really looking at the, um, not NGOs as much as uh, rebel groups who right. they sometimes they formed them. NGOs or were part of the NGO. Um, but clearly his argument is, is being picked up by a lot of people who are saying that it these actors are strategic, that they're able to use and manipulate the international community, and that they will engage in this kind of behavior actually to attract funds <laughs> um, and, and get international involvement. Um, I think it is part of a literature which is much more skeptical about you know, the motives um, and, and the actions. Um, but I think it, mainly it comes from not necessarily the fact that they're they're trying just to attract money, but this need to be more professionalized, you know, this, the, the need for accountability, um, and the need for funds. Um, and that need for funding does drive I mean, does a that lot affect, of their behavior. I mean, do you see instances where you've got humanitarian NGOs choosing not to get involved in some conflicts, but choosing others? I'm sure for these reasons. Yes, very definitely. And, and, you know, part of that then comes back to the media. I mean, you know, the, the people contribute, particularly in the Western, uh, people contribute to the kinds of conflicts that are broadcast on the media. Um, so, you know, there are wars, there are certainly conflicts all over the world that don't attract it. And, and every, there's really good first-hand evidence, of, again, just NGOs saying, we've got to be involved in this conflict, and we've got to get into Burundi because there's enough going on there that you know, people's attention is there. And they know that in fundraising, um, it goes crisis by crisis. And it's much easier you know, to, um, to raise money you know, with the pictures and with a particular cause um, or with um, a celebrity <coughs> diplomat there <laughs> broadcasting the cause. Um, than the kinds of conflicts which don't get the celebrities out. To and we know this. You described this as a policy-oriented presentation, but uh, I haven't heard much about policy yet. Oh, okay. How about talking a bit about what, what sorts of policies you think states might appropriately adopt and what sorts of policies you think NGOs might prop, uh, appropriately I guess when adopt. I said it, it was, it, that it was not um, research and theoretical, <laughs> I mean, there's a theoretical framework for what I'm operating and I was looking at policy. So these are policy dilemmas that I think both the international <coughs> governmental organizations, states, as well as the NGOs themselves are confronted with. Um, and, you know, part of the, the effort by the International Red Cross and, and the groups that adopted these, this sort of code of conduct was to, I think, think much more systematically um, about their role. So, I mean, there's much more self-awareness of the problem. And certainly Iraq and Afghanistan have brought that out. Um, and so that there, there are groups um, within these NGOs who are very much advocating that we should not be there, um, that we are too tied to the U.S. government or being too tied to you know, the Colin Powell, the force, force multiplier, <laughs> um, and or particularly making decisions uh, that will take them out of that that dilemma. Um, on the other hand, with states, I mean, I think that, that you know, the European Union's 
uh, philosophy is they give sort of some pots of money. Um, and, and quite a bit of their humanitarian aid is carried out through NGOs. Um, there, it's not as targeted um, to a particular crisis, whereas a lot of U.S. government money is crisis, you know, for a particular crisis for the NGO that be involved in a particular crisis. Um, there are a number of NGOs who, of course, will not take government aid and, and make that as a, their policy statement in order to try not to be tied. I was stopped by a Greenpeace person down on 6th Street today um, who, who started talking about NGOs. Have you ever heard of them? And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Greenpeace doesn't take any money from um, the government. I started talking to him. I said, oh, you know something about them. I said, well, something. Um, so he was actually trying to get petitions to get money because they don't get government funding, which was his purpose. So um, clearly, you know, it's cho those choices have to be made. I think the humanitarian organizations, because they do represent um, the truest humanitarian, have these principles that they are in more of a bind than others. Um, and there are, if you looked at that list that I put up there just represented it, one of the changes that you see in the humanitarian community, which just confuses this, is that many of these started out as humanitarian NGOs, but have moved, in a sense, much more into development, you know, looking post-conflict. And once they do that, that changes. You know, they are then involved in a much more direct way. So, you know, that the ICRC, the International Red Cross, sort of model of independent and um, completely separate and neutral and would never critique a government. Of course, we know the ICRC did. They finally came out against, you know, and made some statements against the U.S. government, which generally they do not do. They do this in secret and that's to preserve their neutrality. Um, but they overstepped that and uh, they have been changing. Yeah, but as you see, the, that move from sort of this group of mainly humanitarian NGOs who sort of do this immediate relief, but then for uh, purposes, then they get into post-conflict where they then are involved in economic development and political development and promoting democracy, <coughs> then obviously um, they, their the goals and what they try to achieve are do you see a better mechanism than the NGO for working through some of these things as we become more global and able to possibly share things? The needs are there, yeah. but uh, is there a better way? I've worked with NGOs quite a bit overseas and ended up becoming very skeptical very and skeptical. cynical about it. Yeah, well, yeah, but I mean, real. if you ever worked with USAID, oh you know, yeah, that was one of them. You know, or, um, you know I, I spent time in the Sahel region during you know drought, where you know there yeah. more NGOs than there are people who are suffering from the drought. <laughs> uh, speaking of competition for scarce resources, competition for scarce people. Um, you know, so yeah, it's a problem. I guess you know. You know, if you sort of believe in a notion of sort of a pluralistic model, that at least if you have a number of different kinds of NGOs and different kinds of leaders, that some of the good ones will emerge and they will do good things. Um, and you know, pretty skeptical about a, a hierarchical model um, in which you know it's one agency or one group that will do this, um, because I think. One of the benefits of NGOs has been, at, and it's their flexibility at the local level, and you know that is very difficult to do if you're, you know, sort of like microfinance. I mean, microfinance in part works because you can experiment at a very localized level, and you can't do that through uh, large international financial institutions. Um, so there are going to be costs to that. There are going to be weaknesses of that approach, but I think there are also going to be benefits of finding out what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and I think one of the lessons that these humanitarian NGOs have learned is that they do need to be involved in the, the recovery process, that you can't just meet the needs 
uh, for food in the refugee camps. But when those refugee camps are dispersed, you need to give them a way to be able to feed themselves or you, know, you need to have another you know, crisis. So that's what's made them move from that strictly relief to much more of a rehabilitation. But I'm sure everybody here who's worked with them, you certainly see all of their warts. And I'm not trying to cover up those warts. I think these are real uh, dilemmas and form. Uh, as, as one writer says, I mean, you know, there's a, you know, an NGO can be a person. It can be a person that exists for you know six months, is interested in an issue, and it can be something that becomes much more institutionalized. Uh, most of the kind of work that I've been looking at inside NGOs are with the bigger, more well-known ones. Um, but of course, there's all sorts of issues about their relationship with the local NGOs, um, which is another topic. Okay. Uh, all right, I'm in the front room now. All right, um, maybe if we go a step further um, in her question. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, with all the dilemmas that you outlined and all the issues that NGOs face, mm -hmm. have we gotten to a point where the NGO system really isn't as viable as it once was, or have we gotten to a point where it's not viable at all, and maybe that we need to look elsewhere, maybe some more direct state intervention, or what basically is your position on how we should, in the future, uh, what system we should use to solve these humanitarian conflicts? I don't think we've reached the point that they should be eliminated from this. I mean, I think that they do serve really useful purposes, and I think we can put up with some of the inefficiencies of, of that of that process. Um, so no, I don't think they should be eliminated and replaced. Um, nor do I think that you know private sector is necessarily going to you know, parachute in and, and solve those kinds of problems. It's useful as some public partnership kind of arrangements work. Um, and clearly, you know, increasingly some of the NGOs um, do work with the private sector. I mean, work with businesses uh, and, you know, for social responsibility <coughs> provides some of the, the, the Walmarts that rescued Louisiana, and, you know, the, the non-governmental uh, and the state was you know, ineffective. Um, so these sorts of situations happen and that should be encouraged when it, when it works. Um, but I think those are very high profile situations that are not necessarily the norm. But certainly in the, in the general trend of where the relationship between NGOs and international governmental organizations is the third part of that pillar are, is the private sector. Um, and they are, they have gotten involved particularly what uh, what views uh, or viewer views does the uh, NGO community hold about the UN Human Rights Commission Council, whatever its current name is? Um, well, of course, the new council is very new. <laughs> it's been around for about 15 years. Um, it's been around for about 15 years. It went into effect in, in 2006, and there was a hope that it would be you know, something different, and that, that, that the states who would be on the commission, or on the council, were uh, not going to be some of the, the major abusers uh, of human rights. Um, and I think there was, when, when it didn't immediately change, I think there was a lot of discouraging <coughs> things, um, including the fact that the U.S., under the Bush administration, first said, we're not going to get, you know, we're out. <laughs> Um, and that has that position has been reversed, and now we are not only um, saying that we are going to participate, but that we are running. It's my understanding last week or so that we would be um, running for office, <laughs> running for a seat on the council. Um, so the signal is that we will try to to use that um, body uh, again, um, and even under its other iteration, despite the problems. The, there were some things that were accomplished uh, through that, um, but uh, it is just one <laughs> mechanism. Um, and you know, they, you know, something like AI or Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, you know, they 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 play quite they they work very closely with that in terms of 
information, providing information, providing checks, uh, et cetera. Um, some of the smaller NGOs are not necessarily happy with that arrangement. Um, but I think the verdict is still out <laughs> um, there's going to be a really meaningful replacement. Since, since we have such a large humanitarian need in the world, what percentage of this kind of aid goes between the war-related kind of institutional <coughs> and the, well, uh, the other needs that are real needs in the world? Well, I mean, in the humanitarian literature, you know, it's both war yeah. and then the natural disasters. And, yeah. and I have stayed out purposely. <coughs> I mean, some of the same organizations are clearly involved in both. Um, I, I, from this presentation, I stayed out of the natural disaster humanitarian um, NGOs because there's a little bit different dynamic there, um, and um, and I, I think more of the dilemmas <laughs> are in the war. But is there <laughs> a portion that's larger or greater, but in the war effort than in the humanitarian? Uh, than the other than yeah. the, the natural disaster? Yes. Yeah, I think so. In, in terms of in, when you don't count just. You know, you could have low-level wars. You could have this displacements of people um, by low-level wars. So even though, and, and the graph that I showed, um, you know, where the numbers of quote official civil wars have gone down and interstate wars have gone down, as you all know, um, actually the numbers of displaced peoples um, and people who are are refugees has gone up. So, um, and a lot of that is because of, of conflict, um, whether it's out and out war, low levels of conflict, um, etc. But that's different than the response to the earthquakes or the uh, tsunami. Uh, Starvation. Yeah. Um, the war. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I wanted to follow up a question that was asked earlier where someone said if NGOs kind of uh, exhausted their usefulness, should we go back to Ranks the government action, and then you brought in the private sector. But I want to just focus this um, uh, a little more narrowly between two options. One of which is the traditional NGO, and the other is what's known uh, in this country as an AID contractor. Okay. And the reason I ask this question is so for several profit. reasons. For yeah, profit. for a contractor. Mm -hmm. for, for, first of all, the work of the humanitarian NGOs, as you uh, acknowledge, has started to converge with the work of USAID contractors in the sense that these folks, they used to come in and just provide subsistence commodities in, in the wake of natural and man-made disasters, but now they started to move much more towards the development end of the spectrum and economic development, political development, democratization, all that sort of stuff. So the work they're starting to do is, is quite similar. And similarly, the AID contractors have started to go away from uh, 20 years ago when I started you know, doing this, they were handing out condoms and stuff like that. But now they've started to go into the stuff that humanitarian NGOs used to do. And in fact, sometimes you see the government will put out a call for proposals, and some NGOs bid on it, and AID contractors bid on it. So I'm starting to wonder, I mean, I'm wondering what the difference between these what are the pros and cons that are, are between them? Do you have any feeling? Are AID contractors because they're, because they're explicitly for profit, are they more professional? Are humanitarian NGOs because they're motivated by more than profit, are they more efficient? Uh, or are they... Well, certainly that image, that they, not necessarily they're more efficient, but they had other um, motives. Um, and, you know, well, a lot of humanitarian... Well, they're humanitarian... The reality in, in a lot of the humanitarian NGOs is, you know, the pay was fairly low, uh, the conditions were bad, you got a lot of young people who went in for a period of five or six or ten years. A lot of my students want to go into this, okay, and most of them go in and they stay for five or six or seven, eight years, um, get experience all over the place, and then kind of you know, burn out, and you decide you want to raise a family, and, you know, life goes on, and it's very difficult to have the normal, quote, life um, in, in, in doing that and certainly in the field. Um, so it changes. Um, the contractors, and frankly, I haven't seen, at least in the scholar literature, and some of you probably may know some, that I have looked closely at the scholar literature on the contractors. 
I've looked at some of the contracting stuff from the view of private security, but not from the viewpoint of the, um, the development of private contractors. Uh, and I don't know an academic work on that, frankly. You may know of some. I, don't I, I just. <laughs> Good question. You need a PhD student, eh? Yeah. Anybody want to just change the topic? Um, you know, I mean, I think the, I, I think the, the idea is that the, they are, they're in the field shorter times. You know, they're inners, outers, um, and that they're short-term contracts. Um, so that they're necessary. They're you know academics who have another life, and, and you go in for a short for a short periods of time or retired AID people who get the contracts who then go in. Um, it's not a professional, you know, it's not a professional career. Um, but I have not seen academic studies that that group um, gee, you may know more about that. I mean you I do know a lot about phonics, which is one of those That's things. true. Uh, but no, I don't know serious analytical yeah, literature. Analytical work on I know a lot about contracting. Okay. Yes, please. Um, I am an epidemiologist with Dr. Scott Border. <laughs> um, I'm glad that you have positive things to say about them so I don't have to be on the defense. Um, and I worked for six years before I broke out. Um, I'm actually still working but, uh, in East Africa, Central Africa, mainly in conflict situations. And um, I think Are I woke up... the American group? Um, I'm, I've worked with a few different of the European sections. Oh, okay. Because, I mean, one thing with Doctors Without Borders, it's a very diverse, I mean, these sections are completely independent. Right. So we talk about it as if it's a, an NGO, when in fact, the French section and the Belgian section, the Dutch section are actually quite different entities and have different views on the dilemmas <coughs> that I talked about. Right, and I, I was going to say that I think every day, I'm, I'm thinking particularly <coughs> of my experience in Darfur, where I was for a long time, mm -hmm. um, all of these dilemmas we grappled with as individuals and as a group all the time. Um, and you go in the beginning, you're optimistic, and you leave and you think nothing's changed. Really, are we doing it? Is this work really significant? You know you know the humans, the individuals you've touched in the communities um, that whose, children's, whose children have vaccines, but you're not sure in the bigger picture what does this all mean, and you're too close to it to really have that perspective. One comforting thought I have that I think may be perhaps self-serving or naive is that the patchwork of different actors perhaps might not be such monoliths that you, not that you suggest, but for the purposes of a presentation, there's the NGO or the state. And in my experience in Darfur, for instance, there was a quite a variety of <coughs> NGO mandates. Um, ICRC couldn't speak out, we could. They could go to places that we couldn't because we spoke out. And so I couldn't work for them, but I knew I was comforted by the fact that, that they could do else things. Could. That there was somebody taking on that role. We would never take USAID money or any US government money, but we would take ECHO funding from the EU because it didn't have strings attached, whereas US government money wouldn't let us give morning after pills to rape victims in Darfur. So, we had choices. Every single actor had choices. MS, uh, Doctors Without Borders has huge private donors. Most of their money is from people like us giving $5. So they're not dependent the same way as um, International Rescue Committee, who does a three-month plan and has to get that funded. And if that gets funded, gets to go to the next one. So I really did find there was quite a diversity. So I'm just wondering if you noticed that Oh, yeah, yeah. And, then, I mean, and that's sort of the pluralistic argument. Yeah, they're, they're, they have diverse mandates, they have certainly diverse orientations, and like you said, they have diverse limitations, <coughs> things they can do and things they can't do, and, and perhaps that diversity um, serves the greater, the greater good, <laughs> that it, those then more things do get done with that level of diversity. I think clearly that's the argument, and if you went to a much more hierarchical or uh, model, that, that you would lose that, that, that diversity. Um, but I think Doctors Without Borders is particularly you know, diverse <laughs> and, and, and particularly interesting because they've been very, um, a lot of the discussions that have gone on in Doctors Without Borders have been quite open um, and, and very vehement debates where people have you know, confronted um, all of these, these kinds of issues. Um, I have a question about like, on the government side. Um, 
Actually, um, I agree to some extent that NGOs need to work with the government on the field because they need to know the information of the local scene. Um, like in natural disaster, is it safe to go in there or how much effort do they need to put in the local region? So the problem is some government like China, they, they are so um, new to the NGO, they can't even deal with the domestic NGOs. Right. So they don't even know how to cooperate with local and the um, coming international NGO when they deal with the earthquake last year in China. So I wonder how the international community can help my government build up the capacity to um, cooperate with NGOs. I'm sure in many developing countries, um, governments may not know how to deal with it. Well, I mean, your example is exactly right. And of course, um, you know, I, I didn't make the argument that about the relationship between NGO and states. I was using that in a conflict situation where particularly the issue was whether you're going to cooperate with the state who is involved in the conflict as an external actor, not necessarily the state that's, that's in place. In the, in the case of China, or actually in Japan, I mean, Japan did not have a, a, a strong NGO movement until after about 95, uh, 1995, and there was very little local tradition. There were a lot of laws that prohibited and made it very difficult for NGOs to develop even in, in Japan. So certainly that tradition, um, once Japan changed the laws and, and they did change the outlook, then um, you know, the NGOs have become uh, much stronger. And in the case of China, it's obviously still a very growing, new, and controversial um, movement. Um, the cases that I was really looking at was in you know, conflict <coughs> um, situations. Um, but one of the, there has been some interesting studies that have come out of the Myanmar <coughs> situation with the, the um, tsunami, or I guess the floods, or the uh, typhoon in uh, Myanmar about the you know, the Burmese government <laughs> and her, um, you know, having to cooperate and not letting the NGOs in. And this. Um, so I think that's a very different kind of issue. But yeah, it, it, you know, NGOs are not an international legal entity. <laughs> they have no international legal uh, status. Um, they are regulated by the states in which they reside. <laughs> um, and the states can put on regulations and take them off. And, you know, have complete authority. In that sense, in an international legal setting, with the exception of ICRC, um, they have no international legal capacity at all. They are an orphan <laughs> from, a, from a legal perspective. I think I've neglected my left, so there will be in the back. Typical. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, in, in conflict situations, when an NGO is being funded by one of the parties of the conflict and is acting from the point of view of both parties to further the goals of that party. At which point, and if ever, do you think they become legitimate military targets? And what sort of discussion goes on in the NGO world about this? Well, I think they clearly do become targets for exactly that reason. Because they are cooperating with uh, the, the authorities, and they are seen as part of the combat team, <laughs> um, and they become a, a target. Um, that's part of the reason that some NGOs don't want to cooperate is their own self <coughs> their skin. They want to save themselves. Um, I think others say that that's the cost of you know, if you are involved in a conflict situation. There's clearly it's always going to be potential to get abducted or get hurt or something. And I'm sure when you're working in Darfur, that is always on everybody's mind. And it's not a, an easy, that's part of the possible scenario that can occur. But I was asking about the legitimacy of treating them as The legitimacy for them? Of treating them as combatants. Well, I think it, <laughs> you know, at, 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 a certain point, <laughs> at a certain point, um, you know, that, that is the danger, certainly. Um, and you know, particularly when you're in you know, guerrilla war or whatever you want to call those war situations, your ability to, to uh, differentiate between combatants and non-combatants breaks down. Well, I'm asking, at which point <coughs> are you treated as combatants? 
even though they're out of uniform. Well, I can't answer at what point. Well, but <laughs> you I, know, it's I, a question I, of perception. Well, no, clearly, you can't answer that question, but I assume there must be discussion among people in the academic world and in the NGO world about this bleeding of non-combatant into roles that are so generally associated with one of the combatants that it becomes a legitimate activity to attack them. And I'm just asking for a comment. Well, I think that, you know, the Afghanistan, I think, has brought that out more than any other. And so the discussions that have gone on as a result of the Afghanistan, probably more than any other, even though some of those same sorts of activities were being done in South Vietnam. Um, quite know all about what was happening again. I think the media wasn't it wasn't quite as, as well known. Um, but um, yeah, the discussions of I mean, that the media has brought us the issue. It's certainly an issue in the psychological community and the anthropologists have got to vary because of their you know willingness to you know the US government has wanted them to be on the team. Um, and the anthropology the academic community has had a very wide vibrant discussion about that, and in many cases, many of them have chosen not to be. Um, the same issue about just accepting the government. Okay, yeah. Um, I have a question, and I, I think you're spot on as well. I think these are exactly the ones. I have a question about whether there are any studies of kind of the long-term effects of these, you know, um, well, on, on like governance and on capacity and the, that kind of thing for the state, because you know, I mean, one of the ideals is that they're not going to act as instruments of government and that they're going to build capacity. But of course, the reality in a lot of these conflict zones is that government has no capacity and there's no capacity to build when um, you're sort of starting from the ground up. And I can give you an example. I did my fieldwork in the eastern Congo, and there's a health zone there that uh, it's too dangerous, too horrible. Nobody else would go there, so MSF took it over, and they took over the management of it and, and all the operational and regulation and all that. And of course, one of MSF's you know cornerstone principles is that people won't pay for services. Um, and the provincial health authorities, who have no capacity to do anything on their own, but who um, have to deal with this mess after the NGOs leave, um, had a fit and had a big old standoff with MSF over their their refusal to you know, charge nominal fees that are charged in all the other health zones um, for services. Um, and the provincial, you know, health inspector, when I talked to him about this, he's like, you know, people are going to come to believe that health care is free. We cannot have them believing that. That doesn't work for the long term. Um, and so do you think he's right? And do you think that, um, you know, is there any evidence of what this does? No, I mean, you, you know, your the case in there is obviously a case where, I mean, you know, the capacity of the state to... Right, well, and MSF, all, MSF didn't, so didn't have to listen to them because right. they have no capacity, they so MSF said, capacity. too bad, we're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, MS, M, MSF has had um, a policy, their view of capacity building is <coughs> training other health professionals, um, local health professionals, so that when they leave, the local health professionals can carry it out. Now, whether those local health professionals have an institution <laughs> To belong to, and that they might get paid to do what they do. That's a different question. I mean, you know, in a case like right. Eastern Congo. Uh, but I mean, and you know, they're so their thinking of capacity is, is my understanding, is mostly training healthcare workers. Um, now that's not, you know, developing development capacity in the state, so that the state can take over the, the health system. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've read a number of cases with MSF where that, that issue has come up. Um, and it's really interesting. But I think they're really in the dilemma of the short term. You know, because they make that assessment. They go in and decide, is the health needs you know, that critical that we need to go in? And sometimes they decide, no, it's, it's not. So they make those decisions all the time about whether to do it. And the same view is my understanding is you know, they also make the decision when to leave. Is the time right and we can leave um, because they do not make necessarily long term commitments to it. But their long term perspective is in training the people, uh, the healthcare workers. Um, but, um, but the economic part of it is an interesting <laughs> part of the issue that uh, you know, probably, as you know, the company's government's probably just their workers are probably just siphoning off the money. <laughs> yeah. All right. We're coming to the end of our time. I do want to take another question that we need to kind of uh, exit um, for us. But uh, 
it's going so to hard. Left, so. <laughs> That's right. Um, my question was like, do you think, I mean, what do you think will make the impact of ICC and Biden President Bush Huron and your community? Oh, well, the NGO community? Well, of course, what the immediate impact has been that they've had. That they've been pushed out. I mean, so you know, and this was one of the big fears. I mean, one of the big arguments to not indict him or to not do, you know, and indict a sitting president was the fear of that this would, you know, the workers would be kicked out and you know the people would suffer in the long term, and you wouldn't get Bashir to uh, the Hague anyway. So you know, that it didn't necessarily serve a long term purpose. Uh, well, I meant like I don't think so. I think that's a pretty particular situation. But, I mean, that situation arose in um, other countries where the sitting president you know, was talked about and died, whether they would, whether the conflict would just continue, whether what would happen to the NGO community. Um, but, um, you know, the ICC made that decision. We can debate whether that was the wise decision. Suggest international responsibility. On the other hand, um, it doesn't get him out of office, and it certainly doesn't change the political situation in Sudan. Can I take, take about a ten second? Uh, ten seconds, because I like. Thank you very much. I'm not with you too. Um, I love you, man. Bashir did not kick out all the NGOs, no. and what Bashir said is, I'm kicking out the NGOs that cooperated with the ICC and provided evidence to the ICC. So I think, that, I think one way of framing Zahra's question is to say, do you think now NGOs will be less likely to cooperate <coughs> with the ICC because it's cutting into their bread and butter? I wonder in that whether the NGOs really cooperated or how they cooperated. I mean, I have no you know, I mean uh, you know. I just, I, I can't, I mean, he could say that, but, um, you know, it's not like what was happening, it was under the ground, or people didn't know about it, and there were millions of other people who knew what was happening, so this was, I, I can't believe that that was a real rational, that was a real legitimate reason that he saved some and didn't save others. I think he was sending a message that, you know, if you indict me, there will be repercussions, and um, he chose to. Well, so, uh, uh, like I said, I like dilemmas, and it stirred up a lot of questions. It's a very vigorous uh, uh, session, and I uh, really appreciate you coming, Karen. And uh, um, I hope to see all of you next week, and I think we should thank Karen for a, a really